Hello everyone. This is the 18th part of the story, I'm Voldemort. Chapter 133, Okay, Karen. Halfway through the school year, Tom received word that Lord Black's bill put forth in the Wisingamot has been passed. Thanks to his many followers, the bill was passed with overwhelming support. The major portion of those that would have voted against it was now taking orders from him. Those on the light side that voted against the bill numbered about half of the light-sided lords, ladies, and elected officials. Others that voted against the bill came from a portion of the minuscule gray side in the Wisingamot, but their number is so few that their votes don't matter much. With the new bill being passed into law, business started booming for Tom's followers. Blood banks were opened in the muggle world under the guise of donating to hospitals. These blood banks are owned by a few of Tom's followers. The blood is taken by muggle nurses, packaged, and shipped to markets in the magical world. Vampires can now buy blood as if it were pouches of juice like Capri Sun. Each pouch comes with a straw to poke a hole for them to drink from as well. Tom pretty much copied Capri Suns with this. Lord Greengrass has already filled greenhouses with Wolfsbane. With a steady supply of the main ingredient, Lord Prince has started mass producing the Wolfsbane potion. Although Tom wasn't willing to jack the price up for said potion, with the number of people that have to buy it each month, they will make a very hefty sum. Some other former creatures were given rights and citizenship as well, but their situations weren't profitable for Tom. Like the mare people, who are segregated from others as they can only survive underwater. What could they do about them? Nothing, except give them the citizenship they deserve. With the newfound profit rolling into his followers' vaults, Tom left school to meet with a luck at Gringotts. The meeting was fairly simple. Tom opened a vault that was designated the organization vault. A portion of every follower's income goes straight into that vault. Tom made sure not to take from those that couldn't afford to give though. Although he's taking their money, Tom won't be spending any of it on himself. If he wanted to do that, he wouldn't have made a completely separate vault. He could have just put it all into his personal vault. The organization vault will be used for things pertaining to his followers. Would they need a base of operations in the future? Would that base need supplies? Not to mention the fact that his poorer followers deserve a paycheck. If they're going to spend their lives serving him every single day of their lives, Tom has to give them some sort of payment. He doesn't have to but it would feel wrong not to do so. With the vault set up, money started rolling in steadily. Every month the Wolfsbane potion sales would bring in a nice sum of money. That along with the blood sales to different markets made the vault fill fairly rapidly. While Tom was trying to calculate how much to pay his followers, the wizarding world went into an uproar. This uproar started with the news of Lord Black's Creature Citizens Bill being passed. Many in the wizarding world were frightened or enraged with the bill's passing. Those that weren't either of those things were the ex-creatures themselves. Although many of the more stable creatures have already left wizarding Britain because of the racism, those that remained were elated. Never would they ever believe the Wisingamot nor the government would help them in any way. In fact, once the news of the bill to ban them from residential areas was being circulated, they all started preparing to relocate to the forest or something. When that bill failed to pass, many of them breathed a relieved sigh. They wouldn't have to flee from their homes for fear of their lives. Then the news of Lord Black's bill was spread and many of them were scared again. Lord Black is known for his hatred of creatures, so they thought nothing but the worst. Not too long after the bill was presented before the Wisingamot, everyone learned how much the bill was supposed to help them. They didn't believe it at first, but then the bill was passed and a lot happened. Newspapers everywhere were printed with the news along with a detailed summary of what the bill pertained. Then, stores started selling blood for vampires and potions to suppress the werewolves during their time of the month. 
the government asked all non-registered ex-creature citizens to come report to the ministry. They needed to register their names, address, and other information. Many didn't trust this and decided against registering, but a time limit was placed on it. The time limit was placed because the ministry is basically giving instant citizenship to any ex-creatures. The news of the time limit started a flood of people to stampede into the ministry. These are the brave few that said fuck it and hoped for the best. Once the news of people actually getting citizenship without some trap going off, the rest rushed to the ministry to register before the time ran out. With new citizenship and actual rights as human beings, they all celebrated amongst themselves. They didn't dare celebrate publicly and risk angering the wizards and witches. The majority of the wizarding citizens were not happy about these new laws. They have been hearing about monsters for a very long time and have no interest in bumping into any while shopping for groceries. It was like the end of the world for many of them. They all thought that something horrible would happen and many refused to leave their homes. Others started packing and left Britain for fear of their lives. Although, these people were few in number. A month after the big news hit, everything seemed to go back to normal. The only thing that changed is people started occasionally seeing others buying wolfsbane potions and blood while shopping. These people tended to keep to themselves and not bother anyone else. Although, that doesn't mean others couldn't bother them. Wizarding Karens descended upon every store to argue with and badmouth the creatures. Whenever one of these Karens would see someone purchase blood or a potion, the complaints would come pouring out. Although they are annoying, these Karens actually helped integrate the new citizens more than they know. No matter what world or time period you're in, everyone hates a Karen. When most would see these people making a fool of themselves while arguing about creatures in the market, they would look at them like annoyances and go the other way. The shared annoyance between the ex-creatures and the normal populace became a bridge that connected them. Chapter 134, Druella's Resolve The rest of Hogwarts went by fairly quickly. Tom and Druella spent almost all of their spare time together in the Aurora. Most of that time was spent on wandless magic. Tom could now do up to fifth-year spells without a wand, and Druella could do up to second-year spells. Other than wandless magic, Tom had nothing else to learn at Hogwarts, so he would portal over to his secret lair and work on the Muggle Tech. While Tom was working on that, Druella started the long road of learning every spell available in the Aurora. She didn't have as much time here as Tom did, so she had to start working while she had the chance. Other than that, the new self-defense club has been a big hit. With such a large portion of the school in one club, Tom had ample opportunities to help bring them together. He would make teams and do team fighting tournaments. Each team would have one person from every house. This way they aren't just fighting other houses, they're fighting together. Due to the work already put in to bring the houses together, not many people had a problem being on a team with other houses. Only a very small amount voiced an issue with it, but over time those complaints ceased altogether. He did other things to bring them together as well. Mainly trust exercises that he's learned from his soul's past life. He did try to implement some fun times in the club as well. One of these times is when he transfigured the place to be an actual carnival. He didn't do any rides but he made as many games as he could. Games like balloon darts, wheel spins, basketball shots, and many more littered the area. Tom wanted the members to have fun and see that no matter what house they're from or what blood status they have, the people around them were their classmates and friends. It worked on some and not on others. Tom wasn't discouraged though. These things take time and he's trying to fix many years of racism and house discrimination. When Hogwarts came to an end, Tom once again was top of the class for every class. Druella was right behind him with many Slytherins scattered below. The House Cup went to Slytherin this year, as Tom didn't mind winning it. He'll have to let another house win it next year though. 
As they were leaving and boarding the train, Tom knew that King's Cross would be packed with people wanting to see him. He thought of just using a portal to get home, but decided against it. He wanted to see if reporters were at the station. If they were, it could be a good time to lay some groundwork for the next election. I'll have to brave the annoying crowds and hope it's not for nothing. He thought. On the ride back to King's Cross, Tom and Druella got a compartment to themselves. The couple was currently glued to one another sucking each other's faces. Tom's hands were firmly grasping Druella's ass as she lay on top of him. Druella was doing something that actually shocked Tom. Her hands were drifting all over his body as she aggressively prodded her tongue into his mouth. When it comes to these moments, Druella has never been this active before. She's slowly been getting more active recently and Tom isn't sure why. Is she getting more comfortable with this stuff? He thought as he massaged her butt. Whatever, this is fine with me anyway. At first, Druella was a bit reserved when it came to intimate moments. Tom took this as her being nervous about her first time, but that wasn't actually the issue. Druella wanted to do more intimate things with Tom other than kissing, but every time she thought about acting on it, she would chicken out. Since she was too scared to initiate it herself, Druella decided to let Tom take the lead, but he wasn't doing that. He was waiting patiently for when she was ready, not knowing that she was waiting for him to take the lead all along. Druella didn't notice this until the end of the year. Flashback Tom and Druella were making out in the hour before bed. Their bodies tangled together on the red bed sheets. This became a routine for them. Before going to sleep, they kiss until one of them was too tired to go on. While this was happening, Druella felt something hard poking her lower abdomen. At first, she thought it was Tom's knee or something, but that couldn't be it as Tom's knee was over there. She realized what was poking her and froze. Tom took this as her not being ready and kissed her on the forehead. It's okay, I know you're not ready for anything more than that. I'll wait patiently for the time you feel comfortable, all right? Tom says with a small smile. She wanted to deny what he said, but every time she tried to say it, her voice would get stuck in her throat. After a few minutes of trying to speak and failing, Druella finally voices her desires. I am ready. She says in the smallest voice. She looks over and sees Tom sound asleep next to her. He didn't hear a thing she said. All of that courage to say what she wanted was wasted on the open air. Sigh. I guess, I have to show him that I'm ready rather than say it. She thought as she cuddled into his side and drifted off to sleep. Flashback end. Since that night, Druella has been trying to be more forward with what she wants. It's been moving at a slow pace, but she's getting there one step at a time. When the train arrived, Tom and Druella fixed their disheveled appearances and disembarked the train. Outside, the platform was packed far more than usual. Parents that came to pick up their children brought family to see the great Tom Riddle. Others that weren't even supposed to be there were standing around waiting to see him as well. Although all of that is annoying, what Tom was hoping for was there as well. Reporters and photographers lined the sides of each exit hoping to get an interview with Tom Riddle. Chapter 135 Interview As every student exited the train, reporters and photographers scanned the area, searching for the man himself, Tom Riddle. Each of them was hoping and wishing that they could get some sort of interview with him. If not, then they hoped he would answer at least one question. They needed something to bring back to print in the paper. Photographers had it way easier though. All they had to do was get pictures as he walked by. The reporters had it a lot harder than them. Soon, Tom walked out with the beautiful Druella Rosier draped on his arm. The second they appeared outside the train, the flashbangs erupted. Flashes from every photographer's camera started going off in Tom and Druella's faces. As the flashes were blinding them, 
reporters started throwing out question after question. How was Hogwarts, Mr. Riddle? Will you be graduating early? What was your fight with Grindelwald like? How do you feel about the new ex-creature citizens? Will you be doing anything special over the summer? Is that your girlfriend, or are you single? A thirsty-looking woman that isn't even a reporter asked. The reporters lost their chance to ask questions at the beginning of the school year, so they're being extra aggressive now. When they came back empty-handed last year, their editors were livid. After all, how hard is it to ask a kid a few questions? After a good 30 seconds of constant flashes and a constant bombardment of questions, Tom finally had enough. Especially after that last question, as Drewella was glaring at that woman while squeezing Tom's arm for dear life. For whatever reason, the woman took Druella's glare as a challenge and glared back unwaveringly. That is enough. Tom shouts while enhancing his voice with magic. With his shout, the entirety of the platform shuts their mouths. The place becomes deathly quiet as no one here wants to anger a man as powerful as Tom. Thank you. Now, I'm willing to answer some questions, but we'll do it in an orderly manner. I will call on you and you will ask one question. I will answer it and then move on to the next person. Does everyone understand? Tom asks and every reporter and some civilians nod without uttering a single word. Good, if any of you step out of line during this interview, I will immediately leave and it will be that person's fault, so be smart or else your fellow reporters won't be happy with you. As Tom says this, Every reporter glances around as if to say keep your mouth shut or else. Now, raise your hand if you're a reporter and you have a question. Tom says and the hands go up. Tom points to one and he fist pumps at being chosen first. Mr. Riddle, how was your fight against the Dark Lord Gellert Grindelwald? He asks one of the bigger questions and everyone listens closely. It was fairly easy. We didn't start out at our full strengths in order to test one another. Once we fought at full strength, I easily beat him. Tom answers truthfully. What was? He tries to talk again, but one of the reporters silenced his voice with a spell. He said one question. Don't step out of line. One of the reporters angrily berates the muted man. I'll let it slide this once. Next. Tom says and points to a female reporter. M. How was school this year? She got nervous and wasn't sure what to ask. Easy as always. It's fun to be around others of my age though. This year I decided to make my own club called the Self-Defense Club. I teach many of the students to defend themselves and ready them for future aura professions. Tom answered again and points to the next person. Do you plan to run for any sort of office after graduation next year? I believe many would vote for the man that slew a dark lord. They ask. No, I'm uninterested in politics as a whole. I find it tedious and boring. Although I understand the need for it, because at the end of the day those politicians run our society. Tom explains and once again points to the next person. Have you heard about the new ex-creature citizens? If you have, how do you feel about them? Another reporter asks. I have to say that I'm very happy with the Weisengamot's decision to finally realize these people are people as well. I don't know what came over Lord Black, but he and everyone that voted on his bill supported a very good cause in my opinion. Tom says, pointing to the next person. Next. What about the many werewolf and vampire attacks that have happened since the bill was signed into law? He asks. Well, there's always going to be small groups in every mass of people that are distasteful, to say the least. We recently dealt with our own distasteful group and these people are just the same. It's my opinion that they should be hunted down and killed. If they can't see the chance that's being offered to them, then that is truly a shame. Tom says with a shake of his head and gestures to the next person. 
You said earlier you don't know what came over Lord Black. Can you elaborate on that? He asked. Well, let's not beat around the bush here. Lord Black has been known to support everything that goes against helping vampires, werewolves, and other ex-creatures. I don't know why he wrote this bill, nor what changed his opinion of these people. Did he have an epiphany and see that they're humans just like the rest of us? I don't know. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not bad-mouthing the man. He helped many people and I thank him for that. I just urge him to make a press release stating why he decided to help these people. If he can give a believable answer, then I will squash my doubts of him immediately. Tom explains his doubts. As he said this the reporters were smiling from ear to ear. They just got the best news they could possibly receive. None of them would dare to write anything against the Great House Black, but with Tom's words, they could now do whatever they want. They wouldn't get any blowback as it was Tom that stated these things. They would just be reporting on his statement. This news would last at least a week, and if Lord Black responds, maybe even a month. All right, that seems like a good place to end our discussion. Goodbye and have a nice day. Tom says as Mimsy appears and pops him and Drewilla away. Chapter 136 Mother and Son When Tom returned to the rosier manor with Drewilla, a confused-looking Lord Black was waiting for him. How did you know I would be here? Tom asks as he and Drewilla take a seat on the sofa. Druella leans into Tom and rests her head on his shoulder. This is something new as well. She used to not like public shows of affection, but that seems to have changed. Men tend to end up wherever their women are, my lord. Lord Black answered with a shrug. Huh? Makes sense, I guess. Tom can't deny his claim as he did come here. My lord, is there a reason why you called me out so publicly? Lord Black asks with badly hidden annoyance in his voice. Because I think that you would make a very capable minister of magic. Tom states as he wraps an arm around Druella's waist. And your idea to back me consists of casting doubt on my actions? The same actions which you ordered me to do in the first place? Some heat could be felt in those words. Now, there's no need to get so upset. Tom says with a playful smile. What do you think will happen when you run for minister? Do you think the people will love you all of the sudden? No, some will but not enough for you to win. Especially when your opponents bring up your past and cast doubt on your recent actions as I have today. So what? You're casting doubt before the enemy can? Lord Black utters with a hint of realization. Exactly, I cast my doubts and you get to show the world why and how you changed to be a better man. When everything is settled, I can safely throw my backing into your corner. Instead of supporting Sirius Black the creature and Muggle hater, I would be supporting Sirius Black the reformed lord that just wants to make up for all he has done. Tom explains and Lord Black's mouth drops open. You planned this all along? Lord Black asked. Nah, I came up with it on the train ride home. Tom says as he waves his hand dismissively. Lord Black just sat there stunned at his lord's actions. He always wanted to be the minister, but he always failed. It seems now is his time. M, thank you for choosing me, my lord. Lord Black says as he stands and bows deeply. I'll do my best to never let you down. Yeah, no problem. Just work diligently and we'll have no issue. Tom says as Lord Black stands and nods affirmatively. Now, I'm sure you can handle your part of the plan yourself? Yes, my lord. I'll have a statement for the press ready within the hour. Lord Black says as he ponders over how to word everything. Good, if you couldn't, then I would doubt as to why you were sorted into Slytherin in the first place. Tom states and waves his hand at Lord Black dismissively. Go and get your work done. As Lord Black left, Druella pushes Tom down and climbed on top of him. 
what's gotten into her lately? Tom thought as their lips met and his hands started to wander. Whatever it is, I'm loving it. After getting caught by Druella's parents, Tom left Druella at her home and went to Camartage as usual. Druella's father was livid but could do nothing about it, while her mother was giggling and encouraging her daughter. When Tom arrived at Camartage, he was met by the Ancient One. She was sipping tea and waiting for him in his room. So, how was school? She asked. Easy as usual. How was everything here? Tom answered and asked back. Nothing too crazy. I had to deal with a few demons and some unsightly apostles of a very angry sex god. They were easily handled though. She mentions her exploits as if they were nothing. Huh? That's it? Usually you have to deal with way more than that. Lucky you. Tom says as he sits down on his bed. Yeah, I've had a lot of me time, which has been good, but that gets boring after a while. I've missed having you here. It's so boring without you. She admits with a fond smile on her face. Well, I'm here now. Tom smirks at her. I missed you too, by the way. Life is boring without my bald robe-wearing mother around. As Tom says this he could see her freeze for a moment. You okay? Yeah. She says as a tear falls from her eye and a bright smile graces her lips. I just like it when you call me that. I feel like I adopted you from that orphanage and it's nice when you acknowledge it, even if you're only joking. She wipes the tear from her face. Tom felt conflicted. He really was just joking but maybe a part of him wasn't? The Ancient One is the only real mother-type figure he's had in this world. Maybe it would be fine to call her that from now on? Well. If you want, I could keep calling you that from now on. Tom mutters quietly, but she heard every word. Not as a joke, that is. Suddenly, the Ancient One leaped out of her chair and squished Tom in a tight hug. Sobbing could be heard as she cries into his hair. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Over and over she thanked Tom for whatever reason. A conflicted smile appears on Tom's face. He was happy about this development but sad about whatever drove her to cry like this. She must have been very lonely up until he arrived. I've never seen you cry like this before. Tom states, but she doesn't reply. After a few minutes of calming her crying, they separated and Tom could see her red eyes and tear-stricken face. So, Mom. Feel better now? Tom says Mom with a small smirk on his face. Yeah, I think I needed that, son she answered with her own smirk as she wipes her face with the sleeve of her robe. Chapter 137 Telekinesis for Dummies once Tom and his new mommy were finished with their big moment, the Ancient One asked an important question. Have your elves collected all of the ingredients for the ritual yet? She asks. I haven't had a chance to ask. Let's find out, shall we? Tom says as he calls for his favorite elf. Mimsy. Pop. Master's back. She exclaimed excitedly as she appeared. Yes, I am. Have all those ingredients been gathered? Tom asks his overexcitable elf. As he asks this, Mimsy stands a bit taller with her chest pushed out proudly. Yes, Master. Mimsy had the elves work day and night to get Master's things. She says happily. That's good. I'll call you when I need them. Thanks for the hard work and let the other elves know how thankful I am as well. Tom pats her bald head. Hee <laughs> hee, Mimsy will tell them now. She laughs joyously and pops away after indulging in her master's head pats. It seems that I have all the ingredients. When do you want to do the ritual? Tom turns to the Ancient One and asks. We need to wait for a full moon and that won't happen until later next month so we have some time. The Ancient One informs. All right, 
Do you have any suggestions on a branch of the mystic arts that I should study while I'm waiting? The last time I chose for myself we ended up meeting an evil celestial slaying god in a shadow dimension. I'd rather pick something safer this time. Tom asks with a wry smile gracing his lips. Hmm. Tom's new mom places a hand on her chin and starts thinking. Yeah, here start working this. She snaps her fingers and a book lands in Tom's lap. Peeking at the cover, Tom's eyebrow twitched at such a lazy and odd name. Telekinesis for dummies. Is this a joke? Tom asks with a raised eyebrow. No, that book was written by one of the best users of telekinesis I've ever met. She was a bit weird, but everything in that book is factual and will help you immensely. She says with a wry smile. What powers the telekinesis? I don't need some higher being from the bumfuck nowhere dimension to make my life difficult again. Tom asks, still slightly disgruntled about his sealed animagus form. It doesn't take energy from an outside source. It uses the mental energies of the user, which means as you practice it, you'll become mentally exhausted. Although, over time and practice your mental strength will grow. Sort of like how you excessive your body. That's why I chose this as your next project. With it, you don't have to worry about and I quote higher beings from the bumfuck nowhere dimension as you've said. She explains and Tom can't help but chuckle at her copying his words. Sweet, I'll read it tonight and work on it a bit before bed. Tom says as he tosses the book onto his bed. All right, I have to go watch over some students' training. I'll see you at dinner? The Ancient One asks as she started heading for the door. Yeah, I'll head over around six or seven. We should get ramen tonight. Tom agrees as the Ancient One leaves him alone in his room. Before bed that night, Tom read over half the book. With his perfect recall, he retained every bit of information he took in. Telekinesis is the psionic ability to move, manipulate and control a multitude of people, not mind control, and objects with the mind without physically touching them, especially over long distances. Depending on the user's skill and power, they may be able to levitate themselves, other objects, and form powerful pushes or blasts and protective shields. Telekinesis uses the mental energy and strength of the user. The need to practice is important, or else the heaviest someone could lift something is a small pin. Through practice and training, mental strength and energy will increase, making it easier to use telekinesis. The beings able to perform telekinesis are named telekinetics or telekines. The first chapter of the book explains this, while the second chapter details an exercise for practice. The exercise is simple. Tom took a small pin and placed it on his palm with his hand held out. He then has to meditate and tap into his pool of mental energy in order to make the pin float above his hand. Due to the mastery of his own magic and eldritch energy, Tom has a bit of experience sensing energies. After only half an hour, he was able to feel the very small amount of mental energy located in his brain. Taking a deep breath, Tom opens his eyes and stares at the pin, while simultaneously exerting that energy. He imagined the pin levitating above the palm of his hand. As if he just cast a levitation spell, the pin starts floating for the smallest of moments before falling back into his hand. Compared to the wizarding levitation spell, this one looks a bit different. As it floated above his palm, the pin was coated in pink energy. That must be what the mental energy looks like. Tom thought. As the pin dropped into his palm, an overwhelming feeling of exhaustion hit Tom hard. Not wanting to fall asleep with a sharp pin in his bed, Tom powered through the exhaustion and placed the pin on the bedside table. As soon as the pin was away from him, Tom passed out. His mental energies were too exhausted for his mind to function at the moment. This marks the end of part 18 of the story, I'm Voldemort. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe the video to listen more. 
hit the bell icon to get notified of all the new content uploaded to the channel ASAP.